Good morning. Welcome. Hopefully, uh, everybody's doing well. Uh, my name is Tack Doran. I'm a project manager with Colorado Time Systems uh, and also serve as kind of the video display product manager and display consultant for uh, large scale video projects. Uh, hope everybody's doing well. And uh, looks like we've got quite a few people joined in here. So I think we'll go ahead and uh, kind of get uh, get going here. The uh, the purpose of this uh, webinar is to go over kind of the the, the nuts and bolts of, of LED video displays and how to properly choose the, the the right size or sizes depending on your facility and why the technology for LED video displays is really uniquely It really is probably the best the, the best format for most of the aquatics environments that we uh, that we encounter throughout the world. So, with all that said, we'll uh, kind of get going. Kind of the the four broad topics that we're gonna that we're gonna discuss are you know you can see on your screen the basics um, and how we pick that display, how we help you choose the correct the correct display for your venue. Uh, what the requirements are to actually install one of these um, in a facility, and then kind of briefly touch on what the features and, and functions of, of our current uh, offerings are, and what the what the future holds, and what kind of upgrades that you can do with with the systems we have now. Keep in mind that everything that you will see here today is geared around what our current generation of displays, which started uh, back about four four and a half years ago um, with our with our new design and uh, so just keep that in mind for those of you that might have existing displays some of this stuff is is kind of newer technology that was introduced in, in this new product so with that let's uh, let's go ahead and get started any any display regardless whether it's on your phone or a uh, the old term jumbotron that used to be used at a uh, ballpark or football field. The basis of every every one of those displays at its most basic level is that pixel. And the pixel is just the individual element that displays a red, green, or blue in this case in order to, or shades of that to make up an image or text as a whole on a, on a large scale display. The kinds of displays that we encounter today are not necessarily just LED video displays, but you every, think of everything from the LCD and your flat panel monitor at home, uh, plasma displays, OLED. The projection systems are just a display that, that's putting you know, individual pixels up to form images or text on, on a wall or, or on a surface. Um, and you can see down there in the little graph, you can see what the pixel arrangement actually looks like. The two that we're going to talk about today in depth are the what's called the DIP or, or through hole LED and the SMD LED, which are in the uh, top right and bottom left corners of that display. But at its basic level, a pixel is nothing more than a way to portray a red, green, or blue or, or shades, colors of that in groups to put your image up on there. But the trick is, is with an aquatics display or in an aquatics environment, especially an indoor one, not all these technologies are are, are the right choices for those. And we'll kind of go into the features as to why. Um, a couple things on an aquatics environment. Uh, there's a lot of, everybody understands that air quality in an indoor pool can shorten the life of, of a lot of equipment that, that's at a facility. And it's primarily through the corrosion. Um, air quality indoors and coastal facilities greatly contribute to the degradation of not only electronics equipment, but even static. You've all been to indoor aquatics facilities probably that have less than ideal air quality. And you'll see things like surface rust or, or even significant rust on stainless steel fixtures. That affects electronics as well. Obviously, you've got water splash, 
display distance from the audience. In, in other words, how far away this scoreboard or, or video display is going to be largely determines that kind of points us towards LED video displays as being probably the best for it. LCDs and flat panel displays are great for close up viewing, but when you get to a larger distance, people can't see a 75 inch TV as well as they can see a 20 foot wide LED display. The other thing too is the brightness. Most of your LCDs are, are capped at about 250 to 500 nits, which is a measure of brightness, a unit of brightness. Um, the baseline for our indoor LEDs uh, video displays is 3,500 nits we can go to. Outdoors, we can get to 10 to 12,000. If you look at the fundamentals of why uh, of, a, of an LED display, you have a couple different pixel types. I uh, mentioned them before. There's an SMD or surface mount device, and then through hole, which is DIP diode insert, uh, insertion package. The through hole is just a typical, what you're used to seeing, regular LED, and you have one red, one green, and one blue. In the SMD, you have a square package, like you can see the little graphic on the bottom there, that is a, inside is a very, very tiny red, green, and blue LED. Surface mount is nice because it gives us a lot of black space on the board, increases our contrast, excuse me, um, and gives us overall better video clarity and image clarity. Through hole is great, the, the top one, because they're extremely bright and they work wonderful in bright outdoor environments um, and, and can overcome that uh, ambient light, sunlight. So the things that kind of the key terms, we talk about the pixels and then the pixel pitch. Pixel pitch is defined as the distance in millimeters uh, in either direction from the center of one pixel to the center of the next pixel, either horizontally or vertically. Other things that we'll talk about, color depth. Kind of, I'm gonna take a step back here and this is one of my kind of industry pet peeves. You'll see a lot of video displays that will quote out we can do 16-bit color, we can do 18-bit color, or even more. I've seen some outrageous claims. That's just the total number of colors that a display can portray in terms of billions of colors or even trillions of colors. Um, key thing here to remember is that even now, even in this day and age with 4K uh, displays in your house, most of the content that you're going to get is at the 8-bit or 10-bit level. So if you're searching and, and you're finding someone's uh, vendors telling you that they're offering 18-bit color depth on their video display, that's fantastic. Most every single display out there can get to that level, but the content isn't at that level. So we're do it's doing some things to kind of enhance it, and that enhancement is not necessarily a good thing. Um, you can have really good algorithms that will enhance the color depth of a given piece of content from 8-bit up to 16-bit, but it doesn't, but there are also some really bad algorithms out there that make it look pretty bad. Um, brightness, brightness of a display is in, in terms of, it's given in, in its industry standard of NIT, and NIT is just a, a Think about it, how bright a candle is at, you know, a candle flame or a flashlight, that sort of thing. The higher the nits, the more ambient light or sunlight I can overcome. Typical indoor ranges is you want to be somewhere up to about 3,500 nits would be ideal for very bright indoor displays that have a lot of windows in a facility that are getting ambient light in and potentially glare on the board. Outdoor, you want to be in... You want to be north of 7,500 nits, and that a lot depends. We'll kind of get into this in a little bit for outdoor displays. But which direction the board faces? If that board faces due south and sees sunlight all day long, you want that number to be in that, say, 9,000 or higher. And that a lot of that also depends on architecture around it. If it's a giant concrete slab that's sitting underneath this, and I have windows opposing, you know, that are that are that the board is facing and I may get reflections off that I may even want to get brighter and that's one of the things we'll talk about why we like to do site visits and kind of get a get a get a picture of the whole facility uh, so that we know we're choosing the right helping you choose the right display for your facility viewing angle 
you'll see this one thrown out there on spec sheets for video displays. Uh, viewing angle is just the dist the, the kind of the industry standard for this is the dist or the, the angle at which from from facing straight onto a display, how far of an angle can I go before the brightness drops in half? So that is particularly geared towards images and, and video. And we'll get into why in an aquatics display, it's not necessarily the key feature you should be looking at, but you should also know that geometry, hard geometry plays a role in this. And so, in, and we'll get into this a little bit later, but you'll see if you start seeing some outrageous claims and spec sheets on, on what a view, what viewing angles are, just kind of make you think in the back of your head to, to be a little bit skeptical of those numbers and why. And then finally, kind of the other key terms we'll be talking about is viewing distance. And that is when you're very close to even your LCD panel or your monitor at your desk, you can see, if you're, if you're close enough, you can see the individual pixels. On an LED display, because we're quite a bit bigger in spacing between those pixels, there's kind of a minimum viewing distance. And most of the time that, well, all the time that viewing distance is really related to images and where our eyes stop seeing the individual pixels, but see the picture as a whole. Um, and, and we'll get into why that uh, it's a little bit different for text and than it is for uh, video as well. So now what, are, what kind of considerations should we be looking at when we're choosing that LED video display for your facility? Uh, a quick step back, and, and we talked about, you know, the competing uh, formats that might be used in a facility, especially like an indoor facility with an LCD. One of the big things on an LED video display is it allows us, because of the way the components are laid out and the way it's designed, it allows us to provide extra protection for a display in that corrosive air environment with all those chloramines floating around. LCDs, plasmas, uh, projectors, you name it, don't necessarily have the ability because they use such a different technology in order to turn those individual pixels red, green, or blue. Whereas I have an actual LED that I can put in a package and protect that package, we also go the step further and we actually conformal coat. We think of it as a clear, ultra clear, water pure, water clear glue that goes over the, the LEDs and all of the electronics components to protect it from that, um, those chloramines that might start attacking those, uh, the, the circuitry of the board. Things like flat panel displays, you'll see them last in, in, in certain indoor facilities with really good air quality, but the reality is they're not going to last anywhere near as long as an LED video display because we can provide that extra protection where on an LCD TV, I just can't. Um, there's just not a way to protect uh, protect those electronics necessarily as well as we can do an LED video display. Um, obviously, your first consideration is this an indoor or an outdoor facility. For indoor facilities, we need to do a realistic uh, assessment of the air quality. If there are things like large-scale surface rust on, on stainless steel fixtures, start blocks, grab rails, those sorts of things, we need to look at that. Um, and, and need to understand how how best to make sure that this LED video display is going to last you a long time in that environment. Um, location facility, a lot of that will be, you know, can we mount it where you would like it or where it would be best for the general viewing audience to see it? Um, and then also what kind of infrastructure requirements are there in terms of power, how we get data signals to and from devices or from the display to the timing devices scoring devices, say for water polo or diving. Outdoors, we like I talked about before, we got to understand which way, which direction this display will face because it will largely choose that display for us. If, if this is a direct south facing display that sees sun and sees reflected light off of concrete uh, or glass structures around it, we may immediately just say, you know what, we got to do a through hole because we got to have that brightness level high enough that people can see this in the midday sun. Again, location facility, uh, feasibility in terms of how we're gonna mount this. Is it on a wall? Is it on a structure? Is that structure feasible to mount uh, in the location that you would like? And then same thing with uh, infrastructure in terms of power and uh, data paths back and forth to the board. 
So the audience distance. I'll give you a kind of a, a little bit of background on this. Our brains, and everybody can read the text that's on the screen, but our brains process these images and texts and text just slightly differently. Um, our brains are trying to assemble these individual LEDs into a picture uh, when we see an image that's up on a board on, on an LED video display or even on an LCD display. The farther apart those um, that you are, or the farther you are away from that display, the, the, the faster your brain puts those pixels, stop seeing the pixels and start seeing an actual image. You can see the little graphic below. It's kind of a, we did a, a 3D rendering of, of what a four millimeter pitch board would look like trying to display a, a particular image. While it's pixelated, if you stand back from the computer, it starts to get clearer and clearer. So understand that for images, you get too close, you just see the pixels, you start to, you stop seeing the image as a whole. But text is a little bit different. Text, your brain starts to read the, the characters almost immediately, regardless. And so the pixelization of it is not as big of a, a problem with images. And therefore, those viewing distances that you'll see published in spec aren't necessarily the be all end all because it looks be realistic in, in an aquatics environment for swimming, diving, water polo, uh, even you know synchronized swimming, for instance, you see primarily it's information that we're putting up there. It's textual information. And so you got to keep in mind that the board is not always just used for full motion video or full motion graphics. It's, it's a predominantly for lane weight time, uh, a swimmer's name, their affiliation, those sorts of things. So the pixel pitch, like we talked about, plays a plays a big role in how close I can be to this display. If you have a small, uh, a smaller facility that's a 25, uh, you know, say a 25 meter or 25 yard pool, you've got limited deck space on each side of, on, on every end of the pool or every side of the pool, you may want to start looking at a smaller pitch board just because your audience as a whole is that much closer. And we also need to look at not just the viewing audience or your spectators that are there, but what about coaches and, and athletes as well and how close they are to a display. Keeping in mind, if we're going to be just mostly text, we can get away with a little bit larger pixel pitch. But if you're going to be putting up images, graphics, slideshows, ads, uh, or running you know, full motion video, you probably want to lean towards that, that, that smaller pitch. Kind of the industry average right now is about a 10 millimeter pitch uh, for, most, uh, for most locations, uh, indoors. Outdoors, it, it's tough to say. Outdoor 50, mil, uh, 50 meter pools, we're, we're kind of running towards the 16 millimeter or 12 millimeter depending on what the budget looks like. But we've been quoting and, and doing a few 10 millimeter and even eight millimeters outdoors. So a lot of it, it, it depends on, there's a lot of fun factors that go into it. The graphics that you can see across the bottom, that same image roughly uh, that's on the far right of the emoji is portrayed on the far left as uh, you know, what that looks like on a 12 millimeter pitch. You can see you don't really you don't get the gist of what that image is necessarily this close to it. But the two texts are the same thing. We've got on the left a 12 millimeter and on the right uh, a four millimeter. Arguably the four millimeter gives us a lot better clarity because we have way more pixels to draw that graphic. But the brain can pick out the fact that that's a W on that 12 millimeter pitch immediately. Whereas you might have to squint a little bit or, or back up a little bit to see that, that that's an emoji on the far left on that 12 millimeter pitch. But it kind of gives you a good visual representation of what, what that, how that clarity increases as we get to the smaller pitch displays. We'll go back and we'll talk more a little bit here about the angles. Um, the graphic or the picture that you see in the upper right hand corner, I'll zoom in on that actually. If we talk a little bit about what the viewing distance is for uh, for the images and graphics. This 
particular pixel or pixel, excuse me, this picture was taken six feet from the face of the board and essentially at the far uh, bottom left corner of the board. And the first thing that should jump out at you is how clear the text actually comes out. But if you look a little carefully, a little more carefully, if you look at the graphics, say for instance, in the upper right hand corner and the upper left hand corner, they're a little fuzzy. Uh, and that's a function of that viewing distance and the viewing angle. So understand that the the typical viewing angle that, that we're going to see, and this is really geometry based, is your standard is going to be between 140 and 150 degrees, and that's four images. The picture in the upper right, I'm probably getting closer to about 150, 560 degrees for the, the content on the far right hand side of the board. So you can still read the text, but the images start to look fuzzy and, and potentially pixelated. If you see viewing angles published higher than 150, well, actually probably 160 in, in some cases, um, I, I'd be leery because the, the, the reality is, is that we're starting to get into the geometry where one pixel, the pixel that's closer to you is actually going to block your view of the pixel behind it. So the brightness and the quality and clarity go down as you get to those bigger angles. So just take with a grain of salt the viewing angles that you see published. Um, as you move from dead center of the board, your brightness and clarity decrease. Uh, how much they decrease depends on the quality of the board. Uh, for ours, you get into that 100 to 120 to 130 degree angle, and you're still pretty crystal clear in terms of image quality. Uh, some some of the cheaper LEDs that you'll see, and, and, and keep in mind, these are a commodity anymore, these boards. So if you see two boards that are specified as the same physical size of the same pixel count, and one is $20,000 cheaper, there's a real good reason why that's cheaper. That LED has lower quality, has lower clarity and brightness to begin with. So we kind of have tried to find that middle ground where it's cost, where we've got a good cost effective solution, but we don't sacrifice that clarity and the quality of the components that go into these boards. Um, the graphics down at the bottom, you can see these are all angled. Um, you've got an isometric view of the, of the emojis and you can kind of see how the clarity is, is reasonably good for the 12 millimeter on the left hand side. But you'll notice that even at the extreme angles, that W is still readable and recognizable immediately for you. Four millimeter pitch gives me better clarity because I have more pixels to display it. But it's still the the W is in, is immediately uh, can be determined with uh, without having to squint or step up. So physical size requirements is something that is primarily based on the facility itself and what you do and what you how you program your pool in terms of do you do two pool racing. Is there architecture that we need to account for? Um, you know, how big of a display is needed? Our kind of guidelines is that a nine foot by 16 foot is a fantastic size for up to 10 lanes of, of, of racing. Now, that gives us, on a 16 foot wide, that gives us enough room to put lane, place, time, splits, and a swimmer's name and and a, you know their affiliation, their school or, or or what what have you club. We can put those graphics up there, and it's viewable from 160 200 feet away. Now, the architecture of a facility though might actually determine that I can't fit a nine foot by 16 foot. So a lot of times we like to work with the architects or if it's an existing facility actually come out and do site visits and, and figure out what the biggest display or what the, what the perfect size display is for you so that you you get the information portrayed up there that you want. And that's one of the things that you, know, that you need to keep in mind ahead of time is, what do I want to put on this board you know, in terms of swimming? If I'm, if I'm doing two pool racing, understand that if I want to have lane, place, time, names, splits, and affiliations, 
I now suddenly for two pools, I've got to get to a 25, 30 foot wide display. If I only want to do just lane, place, and time, no names for two pool racing, I can get away with that on a 16 foot or 17 foot wide board pretty easily. And then, you know, say like at finals or whatever, if you're doing, you know, you know, two pool racing for preliminaries and then finals, you split to a single pool. Uh, I can get all that information on there, but understand that when you do two pool racing, um, it, it on a say a 16 foot wide board, I'm gonna I'm gonna shrink the available amount of, of data that I can get for both of those pools on there. Taking into account uh, viewing distance and for the audience, athletes, coaches, we talked about that briefly, and and kind of where everybody is around the pool and and understand that. Look for the average, not for the extremes necessarily. If you if you shoot for the average, we can size a board with the pixel pitch and the, and the physical size of a board pretty well. That that the, that characters that are going to be portrayed on there are viewable to anybody at the extremes. But we do need to know what those extremes are. But we want to kind of guide this towards that average distance that everybody is. Uh, viewing angles, obviously, we don't want to we don't want to approach anything near the the maximum viewing angles for the majority of the audience. We prefer to keep the majority of the audience in that dead center viewing to say about 30, 40 degrees from center on, on, on either side. And that just optimizes everybody's experience with the board. And then the big one is always the budget. Um, a lot of times when we're choosing a board for a facility, we'll choose, we'll, we'll kind of key in on what you're, how you're using the pool and how many, how much information you really want to display. That'll start to pick the physical size of the board, and then we'll come down to finally the budget, and that will help us pick the pixel pitch of the board. And then we can kind of, and and, and in in that process, we can also once we get to the budget and, and figure that out, we can also kind of guide you towards the pros and cons of each of the different pixel pitches and how they'll look and and, and what you'll see in that that uh, in that facility. So the things you do need to keep in mind for installing one of these, what, what's going to what's gonna be needed on your side in terms of power, mounting, communications, uh, access for installation, and those sorts of things. Max power requirements is how we uh, list the specs for the board so that we know we have enough electrical power to cover or to, to supply to the board so that it can be as bright as it needs to be. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so voltage, we sell two varieties of boards, but we can we can do others as well for, for international uh, customers. Uh, our primarily vo primary voltage here in the United States is 120 volts. We do do a number of 240 volt ones. Um, the Actual connection from uh, from our displays is a uh, we just have a power whip with a plug on the end of it, and and the electricians will just need to install an actual outlet up on the board. We have a four inch cavity around the board that's covered by trim, uh, was where the outlets or where the where the data or excuse me where the electrical can go. One thing I do need to to mention and you do need to keep in mind. Uh, is will your facility require GFCI or ground fault circuit interrupt protection for that display? Now, this varies with location across the United States and across the world. Um, some locations uh, absolutely say, yeah, you know, we've I've seen some some the National Electric Code addendum specs that go in and say. If there's a chance this display could fall off of the structure or the structure could fall over and it could reach water, then it needs to be on GFCI. Kind of a strange way to do it. Um, but understand that GFCI is, it's a, it's a sensor in a, it, it really is, it, it is a sensor that senses how much voltage is going to ground on a given circuit. LED video displays are made up of power, they have a series of power supplies in them that transform the 120 volts or 240 volts to five volts DC. The actual nature of a, of a power supply always has some leakage to ground. 
Uh, it's fairly small, about one milliamp. But if you have a cabinet for an LED video display that has four power supplies in it, suddenly I'm at four milliamp. Your standard GFCI protection says that anything over five milliamps will trip that GFCI circuit protection. So if, if a facility has to be on GFCI by code, we need to know that because that will change the total number of circuits or, or, or outlets that are required to run that display. And usually it's a, a rule of thumb is double. If a video display uh, drawing calls out, it needs uh, under standard conditions, it needs six 20 amp circuits at 120 volts. If it's going to be on GFCI, you're going to need 12 circuits at 20 amps on 120 volts. So that's just something to keep in mind. And then indoor versus outdoor. So kind of our indoor spec, well, it is our indoor spec, and what the max uh, wattage per meter squared of that display is. You can see 6 through 12 are all 500 uh, watts per meter squared maximum. The 4 millimeter pitch drops down just a little bit, and that's there's really no physical difference in the circuitry other than the fact that on a 4 millimeter, I have that many more pixels to get a certain brightness out of the display, I can lower the power a little bit and get that much uh, brightness out of the display. And these are guidelines that we work through. Keep in mind, our boards are modular in, in nature and they, so they go up in individual cabinets. Your board may be nine feet tall by 16 feet wide, but it's made up of, you know, say 15 individual cabinets. So your total power requirement for a nine foot by 16 foot, 10 millimeter indoor board is somewhere around 64, 65 amps maximum. But when you break those into cabinets, we can't go over an individual 20 amp circuits rating. So we'll actually have six 20 amp circuits to run that just to load, to balance the load on the power. Um, here's the outdoor specs. You can see uh, we have two versions of the outdoor for SMD and for uh, the through hole. One thing you should notice is that the through hole, the the max the max power is lower, which is interesting. But if you think about it, I have three individual LEDs that are brighter in nature than those small rect or square uh, packages of LEDs. So I can get a lot brighter display on less power using a through hole versus an SMD, which I have to drive very, very hard to get outdoor brightness levels that, that we need at say minimum 7,500 nit brightness. Um, and these are things we will work through with you to determine total power needed for a display. Um, and we can even, you know, if power is an issue, we can work within your your restraints to get the right. Uh, get the right power up there and, and a display that fits what you have. So structural requirements, indoor, you know, things to think about, indoor and outdoor. Um, you know, what's this going to, what's this display going to mount? Where is it going to mount? How is it going to mount? The simplest kind of in terms of of our installation in is kind of listed there from from easiest to to hardest. Uh, CMU wall or, or concrete masonry unit block wall, precast concrete, very, very simple structures. We go in, we do concrete anchors for vertical supports that we that hold the display up or hold the, the cabinets of the display up. Uh, precast concrete. The reason we know to need to know the difference between CMU and precast is just changes the the anchor type that we use. Um, and we also need to know, you know, we'll we'll work with you to figure this out, what what anchors are required for your area. Some areas of the country, uh, you know, earthquake prone California requires a different anchor than, say, middle of, of you know, middle of Ohio, that sort of thing. Freestanding structures. If this is an existing freestanding structure and we're adapting it to an LED video display, we need to know the physical dimensions of it. We also are going to need to know what it's capable of holding uh, in terms of weight, yeah, wind loading, and also what the footings look like for that now we can we can make guidelines or we can make uh recommendations based on, on existing physical structures or, or freestanding structures we don't have we we are not uh we don't have uh you know pe's here that are that can stamp structural drawings we can send those out for a cost but um a 
a lot of times it's cheaper for a customer to actually engage a an engineer in their area and and we can walk through that with them to determine the best way to mount it on a structure um, and then other types of things you can see some some graphics we have here this one in the uh is here what looks like a standard uh cmu or concrete wall and this is why i kind of get in it's important for for you got for everyone out there if you're thinking about doing this in an existing facility have us come out and take a look at it uh this particular one we only saw ever through pictures um when we got on site to install it was determined that the wall behind this display was not actually a concrete wall. It was a stucco sheetrock wall with a cavity of about eight inches behind it to the actual block wall. So we had to make certain uh, adaptations to get this installed, which delayed and slowed down the installation. Those are things to think about. Um, this graphic here is just your kind of freestanding general structure, but we needed to know the physical size of it and how we could attach to that and adapt that existing structure to to mount this new LED video display for this customer. This one, um, this particular building here did not have a wall that could hold the board. Um, so this actually was at, this was at when this was put in this older display and we're actually retrofitting this one here in the next month or so. Uh, with a new display. this That display is actually 14 years old, I believe. Um, that's a hanging structure that was designed when the building was built. This was determined as the only feasible way to mount this display. But these are the kind of installations that we run across that, you know, we and especially for existing facilities, we want to make sure that we get our eyes on everything that's there. And here's another interesting one. This is an indoor facility that was determined that the best place to put this board was at an angle. And unfortunately, that angle included a bank of windows, as you can see on the, the back side here. Um, all over in here is nothing but windows. And so we didn't have a choice but to, uh, to, to come up with a freestanding structure on an indoor facility to mount this to. Not the easiest, but it, but it came off with, uh, without a hitch. So. Back to the so these are just those are some some things to keep in mind. The here communications. Sorry, I'm having a technical difficulty. Communications. So there's a lot that goes on in how our boards communicate with the rest of the swim timing equipment or aquatic uh, sports equipment. So one of the things, zoom in on this drawing here. Hopefully everybody can see this clear enough. So we have, let's take the example for a uh, an actual swim meet. We have a, a swim timer be it an older System 6 or our new uh, Gen 7, either serial or legacy timer. And picture these two, those two components out there on the deck at the, uh, at the uh, timing table. So you've got meat management laptop that's got a direct uh, RS-232 RS serial connection between that and the timer. The timer is nothing more than just a data collection device. And that data collection device is just getting a lane number and the times for that swimmer. Meet management is aggregating that with the actual swimmer that's in that lane. So we, the, the timers are just data collection. Meet management handles, let's put a name with, the, with, with those numbers. Both of those in turn have a RS-232 signal going back to the, our, our display link control PC. Now, display link plus actually is the brains behind getting information or content to these video displays. Display Link Plus allows us to create templates, uh, kind of 
you know, drag and drop nature where we can put things like lane, place, time, school names, um, split, those sorts of things on a template, send it out as a video signal to the controller for the video display, and then consequently up to the board. It takes in the swimming time, the running times, finish times, splits, all that stuff from the uh, timing console. It is also taking names, scores, results, those types of data in, uh, entries from the meet management computer into it to put them all together to display up on the board. Um, its connection to the LED video LED display controller is either usually through display port or potentially a DVI connection. There's also a USB connection between that display link PC and the controller to manage the controller. So there's there's uh, a software piece on the display link uh, PC that allows us to control and do things uh, set up and, and diagnostics with the controller and consequently the, the video display. You've also got um, the ability in our standard basic package to have multiple video inputs, uh, HDMI, VGA, DVI, SDI, uh, component, composite, you name it, we've got it on there uh, as a secondary or, uh, or as another video input into that controller. That controller can take, and our, our standard package can do two zones on a board, a picture-in-picture -picture, uh, is what we call it. So we can set up one set of content, let's say it could come from a streaming device like a Roku or an Apple TV or your tablet that sort of thing through any whatever format it sends out, we can send that up to the board. We can do it as full screen and scale it, or we can do it as picture in picture. And this graphic kind of picks out, you know, you, you can, the ability, we can put that Colorado Time Systems uh, banner at the top as part of the picture in picture coming from one of those sources. The main content for the board is coming from the, the display link PC through that display board. Um, we then send that signal out via either, we prefer fiber optic cable, um, but there are a lot of facilities that we can do an ethernet connection using CAT6 cable from the display controller up to the board. And notice there's two lines called out because it's a send and receive. So we get real-time data and diagnostics back from the LED display uh, through the controller and back to that PC. One thing to keep in mind, Ideally, we would like to have these components that are shown at the bottom of the screen in a environmentally controlled office. Something that's got, you know, air conditioning is not subject 24-7 you know, to pool air. These are the components that aren't necessarily real easy to harden and, and coat and, and protect against those chloramines and, and the corrosive environment of pool air. So we like to keep these in an office. If there's, if that's absolutely not possible, well, we have some, uh, we have a solution for that as well, and I'll show you in a little bit. Um, but ideally, our, our, we like to have these in a controlled environment to prolong their life and make sure that they're going to serve you for a long time. So. We we'll go back, and so these are some of those control our permanent system control options consists of a desktop PC uh, monitor and then the controller for the board. The we will then you know all the all the cables will come into that office, be terminated into that office, and the connections are there. This is meant as a permanent solution. In other words, we set it up once, and it's, <clears throat> it stays there for the life of the, the of the display. A portable system. There are a lot of facilities, and we'll be honest, there, there are a lot of pools, outdoor pools are one of them, where we just don't have office space that's readily available or readily accessible to the to the pool itself. So in those instances, we offer a portable system that is a, a, a portable rack uh, that, that everything is packaged in one. The la there's a laptop instead of a desktop PC uh, that controls this. And it all can, can be set up and taken down, you know, in, in a few minutes. There's just a few connections. Those connections you saw in your diagram uh, earlier uh, between the meat management and the timer would all take place, let's say, out at the timing desk uh, and right directly to this little portable rack. 
there are some differences between these systems though that you need to keep in mind. The biggest thing is, is that anytime you want to use a display that has a portable system, you need to drag this out, set it up, make the connection. So if you have a if you at, at your facility you want to run ad an ad loop during the day when you're not using it as a competitive pool for swim meets, this would need to be drug out, set up, and and running. Um, but it's we don't recommend that this sits out there in in that pool air. 24/7 because these components will not last. These are the these are the very fragile components of the system, and we prefer to keep those in an office. If you absolutely want to run that sort of thing where you've got 24/7 ad content, but you don't want to, you know, have you don't have a dedicated space for this, we can work on multiple locations to control a board from, and so you could put this portable computer system in an office that's not necessarily easily accessible to the pool so you can run your 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 rotating loop of ads um, when you're not running a swim meet but then take it down put it back up in a, in the pool when you're running your swim meet for, for ease of you the other uh, difference between this system and the permanent system the permanent desktop system currently has another video input uh, a, a card in the PC that allows four video inputs to come in to the PC itself the portable solution does not have that option, so that's another thing to keep in mind. If you're fine with the video inputs that come on the controller for the display, that's not usually that big of a difference uh, or big of an issue for people. But just something to keep in mind and, and how we locate or where we locate those control pieces. Uh, installation access. Is there enough deck space for installation? Can you get a scissor lift in there? Uh, a big enough scissor lift that's, that can handle two people, um, can handle up to 800 pounds of equipment being lifted up and down, say a 32 inch wide or a 36 inch wide or even bigger uh, lift depending on the height of the display. And we were talking about how high this is going to be. Um, these are things to keep in mind that, that can add cost to a display if you're not careful. Um, if you have to go 35 feet up in the air, that obviously that lift is more expensive and it becomes a bigger lift. Can you get it in the facility and can you get it underneath and still work on the display? Corner mounts are another one. If you have it mounted in a corner, is that corner mount going to stick out so far that the lift won't be able to get around the corner of the pool? Um, are there obstructions, air ducts? Uh, are there lights in the way, diving towers? The, the picture in the upper right here is a, while the installation access was great, there was 12 feet or more of deck space down underneath the board. The reality was is that this wasn't necessarily an installation issue, but this was a final um, uh, viewing issue. The dive tower blocks a good portion of the video board that's on the right-hand side. It's, a, it's an older facility, uh, older, uh, installed 23 millimeter board on the on the left hand side and the 12 millimeter video display on the right. But the stairs for the diving tower block a a portion of that video display. Luckily, in this facility, it works out well for everybody that's in the in the audience can see the video display just fine. Um, however, if you if you view if you zoom in down there or you look or picture yourself sitting down at the very far end of the uh, of the stand down there down towards the dive well. Uh, you're right parallel with the face of that 23 millimeter board. So these, you know, unfortunately in this facility, there wasn't really a better place to put it, but there are things that got in the way. This wasn't necessarily, like I say, an installation issue, but it did obstruct the view. This one is ended up being, this was a monstrous 12 and a half foot tall, 48 foot wide, eight millimeter board. But as you can see, there's an air duct that runs what will be right below the video display. That air duct stuck out, I believe, four and a half feet. The deck below it is only about six feet. There's no room to get a lift underneath that and go up and install this board. So a very costly, very large scaffold system had to be put up. In addition to that, it's not a flat wall. There, These columns protrude out from the wall about two, two and a half feet. So there was exist, uh, additional 
uh, horizontal steel work that had to be put up there in order to accommodate the installation of the board. So these are the things to keep in mind in choosing those locations um, and, and know that there are cost ramifications to it um, if you have to adapt or you have to go and use, in this case, expensive scaffolding. The other thing on this is long term, the, you know, every piece of electronics will have issues at one time or another, whether it's in a pool or in your living room is going to have issues. How do I get at it to fix it is another issue. This pool in particular causes some issues. Uh, you know, you can't, because you can't bring a scissor lift in there or even a single man, one man lift in there to get out this board to fix it. Some things have to be done in, you know, we have to get creative with, uh, you know, roll around scaffold or, or, you know, if, if you ever have to get up there. So these are, these are kind of key things and why I, I always, um, want people to, you know, we always prefer to get out and, uh, and do, uh, site visits to existing facilities, especially if possible. So moving on from that, we'll kind of talk, let's talk a little bit about what our features, our base package in our system, as I've kind of alluded to already, we all, all of our systems include pic, uh, picture in picture, allows us to put two forms of video content up there, display link plus being the one primary, and you can use a secondary via HDMI or the DVI, you name it. Um, it gives us the ability to do multi-zone displays with that, in other words. In addition to that, within Display Link, we can do backgrounds and overlays. So if you really think about it, really get technical about it, we give you three zones uh, of, of viewing in that. Um, and we're going to do some more in-depth webinars, too, on Display Link itself and how to take advantage of some of the features and functions of Display Link in order to get more content up on your board or the, you know, the kind of content you want. We can do slideshows and looping content that run. We can schedule those. So you, if you have ads, you can use this as your ad content generation and, and playback. We have a facility that, that uses Display Link after they realized how easy it was to use. They use it for their entire site. And we'll talk about kind of that in the, in the add-ons, what we can do with Display Link and that controller. Um, Auto Switch is a feature within Display Link that allows us to take cues from the race timer out on the deck to change what content is on the board. It's a really nice feature because you can, especially if you don't have a lot of personnel to run a board, you don't necessarily have to have someone sitting there running a video display during a swim meet. You can have a lot of this kind of automated in the background. Our direct integration with meet management systems is there. And then also we do display system diagnostics where we can get into the computer remotely. All right, we can do this all through remote assistance. So if there's some issue that, that you can't quite figure out, you can call up one of our techs and they can actually remotely log into the computer and do some diagnostics and kind of guide you, either fix it remotely or guide you towards you know where that issue might lay. Let's talk a little bit about some of the up upgrades and possibilities that you can do with these displays down the road. Because this is a video signal, we can take that video signal coming out of display link. We can send that to other displays as well. You could put flat panel displays in, a, in an official's room or up on a mezzanine level of a pool or you know, outside you could have it at the concession stand. Those sorts of things are, are easily available and we have uh, for additional costs, we have uh, some component packages put together We'll need to walk through it with you uh, either via site visit or would be preferable or or we can even do conferences where we just, you know, try and figure out all the pieces that you will need to to get that content put to displays that you, you know, other displays that you want. Um, we do some formats for external content that we typically do, SDI, which is the uh, serial data interface, which is all the varieties of that, HD, SDI, 3G, SDI. It's just a video format that also embeds audio if you need it. Um, one step back on that audio, we don't handle in our base package, we don't handle, and we don't even in the upgraded ones, we try not to handle the audio side of a, a video signal at all. So if you have an audio system that's in your facility, it's, it, it, sometimes it's best to co-locate the controller for the computer where that audio controls is or get 
a conduit path in there so that we can take the audio from a video signal and send it out to your audio system because we don't we, we don't handle we're not the experts in audio and we don't we, we try not to to deal in audio at all um but it's very easy to strip the audio off of a video signal ahead of time and send it out to your audio system um some other a couple other ways that we can take that content external to the display link control uh display link pc and the, and the video controller hd based t so video over an ethernet cable uh, or sdvoe which is another variety of that kind of the newest one it's, the acronym is uh, software defined video over ethernet that allows and that's in a true that's up to 4k video distribution over ethernet or we've also used some proprietary audio video over ethernet uh, converters to get to displays the biggest thing usually ends up being how far away are these displays going to be from the display link pc and that kind of chooses the technology that we want to use to get it there um, sdi runs on a coax cable and i can get about 450 to 500 feet 500 feet if it's a single display about 400 feet if i'm going to have it to multiple displays hd base t and sdvoe are still capped at the ethernet issue uh, ethernet length which is 328 feet but the nice thing is, is like with SDVOE, I can run through standard switch gear, network gear that's in an environment, in a facility, and run that out there. So that helps us determine that. Uh, some of our bigger, uh, smaller, tighter pit, uh, pixel pitch, we've done four plus zones of, of or segmentations of displays. Uh, the one you saw when we talked about the viewing angle. Uh, that actually has the ability to do nine zones of video content. So that controller that was that optional controller that was purchased for that facility allows nine separate video inputs into it, and you can have nine windows of video on there. <laughs> it sounds fantastic, and it is great for large scale displays or uh, you know, real tight pixel pitch. One thing you want to keep in mind is the physical size of the display that you end up getting may limit how many zones you want because that, that zone may, be end up, may end up being so small that it's not really usable for a whole lot of other content, maybe other than say, you know, names and, or scores and results, that sort of thing. So that's one of the things we want to talk to, you know, we want to make sure we understand exactly how you want to use the display um, and go through all that. And then multi-display synchronization, the graphic down at the bottom and up at the top is uh, an installation we did of three nine foot by 16 foot 10 millimeter displays. Um, we have a controller that actually will combine those at all three into one, or we can use them three as three independent displays um, and, and send the content. So this is just kind of a little graphic representation of us taking one piece of content, sending it to three displays, turning it into one, and then also sending it out to a, an LED video display as well, or an LCD video display, excuse me. So at this point, I think I will open it up if anybody has questions or comments or thoughts. 